Hi, everybody. We did say a 5.30 start, but we know of a few other people who are coming, so we'll just give them an extra five minutes, if that's okay. Okay, great. It's quite loud, isn't it? Is that just my very loud voice? <laughs> it's not loud at the back.
you want me to? <laughs> okay, I've been asked to make a start, otherwise there'll be no drinks. We'll all be desperate for our drinks at the end. Um, just like to welcome everybody to our very first seminar of the academic year for the International Centre for Evidence in Disability. So we're very excited to have the first one. And I would like to um, just explain a little bit. We'll have the um, seminar uh, and then we'll have an opportunity for some questions. And then at seven or before, if there are no burning questions, there'll be drinks and nibbles available and we'll direct you in the right direction for those of you not familiar with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I'm just going to hand over to um, Alan Foster, Professor Alan Foster, who is a co-director of the Centre um, for Evidence and Disability, and he's also the president and CEO of CBM. For, for those of you who don't know, is one of the key international organisations working on disability and development, and is also a key funder for this study. Um, and he, I'll let him introduce the study in more detail. Thank you, Maria, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just going to say a few words and a few slides uh, to really introduce the speakers and also the purpose of the study. Um, maybe a bit of background to the centre. The centre was started at the school two years ago. Um, it came out of, about 10, 12 years ago, a group of us moved here who were very much kind of ophthalmologists and involved in prevention of blindness and we had a centre with the WHO called the International Centre for Eye Health. And that work gradually developed at the school, and as it developed, then, of course, we started working with epidemiologists and social scientists and uh, health economists, uh, et cetera, et cetera, in the school, who then actually kind of said, you know, we're very interested in eyes, but it's a bit narrow. And so gradually what's happened is we've created a, a research group that's addressing uh, different impairments, starting with visual impairment and blindness, but then moving on to hearing impairment, physical impairment, and as you'll see, looking at disability in a wider context. So that's kind of the background to what happened. So the centre is new. It's, as I say, a couple of years old, and the centre is across the whole school. And if you're interested to know more about the centre, or to collaborate with the centre. I think there's going to be some leaflets about the centre and it's got an email on it and you can contact any of us. Um, this is the mission statement of the centre, working in partnership to improve health and well-being among persons with disabilities through excellence in research, teaching and knowledge. So it's actually taking the school mission statement and then adapting it for persons with disabilities. And we developed values by which we want to work with, and those values are that we want to be inclusive, and I think that will come out in some of the talks that you'll hear, a rights-based approach to disability, that we work in partnership with many organisations around the world and many supporting organisations, and that we aim for excellence in everything that we do. Um, many of you will know disability uh, and be very familiar with it, but some won't. Uh, I, by training, am a medic, I'm a doctor, and I have been on a very steep learning curve about disability over the last five or seven years. This is the definition of disability according to the International Classification of Functioning and Health from the World Health Organization. And it's very much addressing the person with disability in his or her world. So from a medical point of view, we're often interested in the health conditions, the diseases. Those health conditions may lead to an impairment in the body. That impairment may be sensory or motor, intellectual, uh, and that's the impairment. The impairment then can lead to reduced activities. So, for example, somebody who cannot see will have a problem flying a plane. <coughs> the activity is reduced because of the impairment. And then that, that reduction in activities 
means there is reduction in participation in society. And there are other factors besides the individual that aggravate that situation of reduced activities and reduced participation. And those factors are environmental, but they're also often attitudinal and the way people think about persons with disability and act towards them. And so that whole uh, interchange of factors is what actually produces the disability. And therefore we need to look at the person with a health condition that's causing an impairment in the context of their whole environment, the person in his or her world. Um, you'll see this picture of this lady later on in the talk. Um, but I, I want to kind of use her to kind of help that understanding of what we mean by disability. Um, this lady I, I do not know. I guess Isla may know her or others. Um, she will have a health condition which might have been TB of the spine or spina bifida or a degenerative condition. That's the health condition, the medical aspect of it. The result has been that she's got physical impairment. The activity she cannot do is walk. And because she cannot walk and have that activity, she may have limited participation. She, as a child, she may not be able to go to school. She may not have employment. She may not be able to get married. All different aspects were external factors and attitudes begin to disable her and exclude her from her society. And that's the kind of context of understanding disability. The person in his or her world. So what, what, why did we do this study? We had three main purposes to do the study. The first was a previous study had indicated that volunteers at the village level called key informants could identify blind children in a village and refer them for services. So this was a very cost effective way to identify blind children in, in a large rural area and refer them for medical and surgical treatment. And the key informants were able to do that and were volunteers. So the question was raised, if key informants could do it for blind children, could they do it for children who were physically impaired, children who were hearing impaired, children who had epilepsy, or other problems like cleft lip or club foot, conditions like that? Could the key informants be used to find those children? So that was the first question. And you'll see the results of that. The second thing was having identified those children, were we able to network with existing services to provide the services that they need holistically? And they may be health services, education services, other aspects, but could we get the existing providers to be ready to provide those services. So again, not looking to suddenly bring in lots of extra capacity, but rather to use the capacity that was there. So the networking of services, and having done that, and we won't go on to this in this particular presentation, what were the results of children uptaking those services? What was the impact on their lives of uptaking those services? So that was the second uh, reason. The third was, if the key informants could identify children with impairments, could we get cause-specific prevalence data for impairments in children that would then enable us to plan future services? So, for example, if you have an NGO that uh, is doing wheelchairs, how many wheelchairs per million population are needed? What, what's the requirement? Or how many hearing aids? Or how many physiotherapies are required for children with cerebral palsy? We need to have an estimate 
of the magnitude of cause specific impairments in order to advise governments and other agencies regarding planning of services in the future. So that, they were the th three things. Could key informants identify children with different impairments? Could we network services? And having done that, what would be the impact? Would, would children take up those services? What were the barriers to uptake? And then what would be the impact on their lives? And we can't address all that in this um, presentation, but that's the second purpose. And then thirdly, can we get figures for planning so that we can advise agencies on uh, what services are needed for children with disability? So my f final job is to introduce our two speakers. And first I'd like to introduce Isla McTaggart. Isla joined our group a couple of years ago, has been involved in running this project in Bangladesh and also in Pakistan. The project is now actually coming to an end. I think it's finishing now, right? And Isla's staying on and actually starting to do a PhD on disability in Africa, which I think starts, and India. Oh, right, okay, good. Um, so Isla will be one of our speakers. Y you can see already she talks a lot. She even interrupts me. Can you imagine that? I mean? <laughs> I've told her to speak slowly, right? <laughs> so if she speaks quietly, just go like that from the back, okay? And not quietly, fast. Just go like that. And second, uh, the principal investigator for the study was Professor G. V. <laughs> Murty. Uh, G. V. and I have known each other, I think, 20 odd years now. Um, GV comes from a public health medicine background, trained in India, worked for many years for the Indian government. He then worked at the World Health Organization on blindness in children. He is now the vice president of the Public Health Foundation in India, and he is the director of the India Institute for Public Health in Hyderabad, which has the disability center. Um, um, GV is, um, works half in India and half with us here, so he has a kind of joint position between the London School and PHFI in India. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Isla, and um, there'll be chance for questions at the end. Is that right, Maria? Yeah. Okay, hi everybody, and thank you, Alan, for the introduction. Um, I do speak really quite fast, so please take him seriously on getting me to slow down. Um, I'm going to talk through the, the sort of background and rationale of the study in a bit more detail, um, and the methodology itself, and then I'll hand over to Professor Murty to talk you through the results and implications of some of the findings. Um, as mentioned, the study was funded by CBM, um, implemented by both the International Centre for Eye Health and the International Centre for Evidence and Disability, both here at the London School. Uh, we partnered with the, the Child Sight Foundation in Bangladesh and the Comprehensive Health and Education Forum in Pakistan. Uh, so as I mentioned briefly, that's just the outline there, a bit of background on the method and how we used it in this study results, implications, and feasibility, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So sort of as a, a background um, starting point, the need for data, and Alan's already mentioned this briefly in his, his introduction, but we know anecdotally that we estimate there to be quite a large proportion of children with disabilities in the world, um, and that the majority of these is estimated up to 80% are in low and middle income countries. That Having been said, there are very few robust estimates that are comparable um, and are available internationally um, for use for the, the various functions that Alan me uh, mentioned in terms of needing to plan for services and um, general um, statistical information. As an example here, the, the UNICEF 10-item uh, screening tool estimates child disability prevalence in Bangladesh and Pakistan at 8.2% and 14.7% um, between the two countries, but other estimates that we have compiled looking at other literature in the two countries have ranges between 0.64% and 15%, so it's a, a pretty wide range to be, to be working with. 
Aside from those, the needs for estimates, there's also, of course, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which very strongly advocates for the need for evidence and the importance of collecting comparable data so that we can, as mentioned, formulate and implement these appropriate policies. Again, as touched upon by Alan, it's really important that we have this deep information in terms of prevalence of specific conditions and impairments, causality, their impacts on uh, a child's activity limitations or restrictions in participation. Um, and with that information, how we can then use it to facilitate early detection, plan appropriate services, and to eradicate those barriers to participation. So prevailing uh, data collection methods for um, identifying and enumerating children with disabilities in a lot of low and middle income countries to date have focused on population based surveys um, and or national censuses. Um, these have their caveats, um, for example, the large sample sizes needed for population based surveys, the fact that they can be costly and time consuming, miss children in specific settings and be um, may face uh, problems of non-reporting that you often find in situations where stigma is related to disability, um, which is also found in census situations, the same situations of stigma and qu questionnaire design um, being different and non-comparable across uh, different methods. So given that, again, Alan has already sort of briefly introduced what the key informant methodology is, but it's an alternative an alternative to a census or a population-based survey approach, which focuses on the training of community volunteers uh, named key informants. Um, so in this regard, the key informants then go out into their villages, their local areas, and case find children with uh, targeted impairments based on, on a training uh, process that they've been through. So they will spread messages through their daily activities within the community, list children that they identify with a targeted impairment, and then refer those onwards to the appropriate um, services. Consequently, it's community-based, it's participatory, it involves local uh, networks, and it can be suitable for some of the children that may be harder to reach um, in other methodologies using population-based uh, surveys or via uh, censuses. We'll go into it in more detail, but just for anybody unfamiliar with the methodology, the, I don't know if you can read that at the back, but a, a quick overview, a flowchart of how the, the method works. Um, so sort of the, the key uh, initial beginning point is the mapping of a community's social networks and sensitization of the community in whole, um, as well as mapping the available referral services and engaging those service providers. Once that's been done, the next step is to identify and recruit key informants from within those villages um, at roughly a minimum of one per thousand population, but it's actually based village-wise, so it's one per village depending on the, the size of the, the village, which obviously varies. Um, the next key step, obviously, is the training of those key informants on identification of children with the impairment as, as is targeted by the study, and I'll show you some of the previous studies that look at, uh, d that have different target criteria. Um, and then allowing, supporting them in the time that it takes for them to go back into their communities, case find based on the criteria, and communicate the messages as per their training. Um, the next step is to then invite the children who have been identified to a screening camp where they can be screened by a medical team, again based on your criteria that may be specialists in one particular area, or as you'll see in our study, it was a multidisciplinary team, um, where the children then examined uh, diagnosed and if they're found to have an unmet healthcare need referred on for treatment. Obviously uh, beyond that there is the follow-up and identification of services that aren't available trying to um, identify <coughs> referral routes in those situations and then at the end obviously in terms of the study design then you've got the dissemination of results which is sort of what we're doing now and we developed a piloted KI retraining module which is not part of the method as a whole um, but we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. So as mentioned, it's previously been validated um, for child blindness in Bangladesh, Ghana, China, Malawi, Malawi and Iran, and for epilepsy in India. I know it's very small, the references are there. If anybody is interested, please just contact us and I can give you uh, 
those reference um, points. So given that, given that validation, again, Alan briefly mentioned what the sort of key objectives of this study was, but what we were looking at is whether we could expand that, knowing what it had uh, been successful in terms of identification of children with particular targeted uh, impairments or health conditions, whether we could expand upon that. So whether or not key informants uh, would be able to identify children with physical impairments, sensory impairments, so visual or hearing, um, or epilepsy within this um, setting. And then if so, whether we could use that information to um, assess prevalence and to plan for appropriate services. Um, and I just want to mention at this point um, that we did not include children with intellectual impairments in this particular study. Um, and that was after a lot of deliberation by the project team uh, based on the two key um, components that one, we did not have the uh, tools at our disposal to actually train the key informants in identification of intellectual impairment in a field setting, and two, that the referral services were not available at the time, so we had no onward referral route for any children that may have been um, uh, identified. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a four-year study, uh, started in 2008 and finishing, as Alan mentioned, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, we worked in three districts in Bangladesh and one in Pakistan and the project developed in a phase-wise manner so we did the, the piloting and the field activities in Bangladesh initially and then they were adapted for use in Pakistan. Um, as a result of that the focus here on the results that we show you will be from the Bangladesh analysis but we'll mention some of the main findings from Pakistan as well. Um, just a touch more information on where we were in each country for anybody who might be familiar with them. We were in Rajshahi Division of Bangladesh. Uh, we conducted the pilot in uh, five sub-districts of Sirajganj and the main study in Natur and Bogra, covering a total of one million population. And in Pakistan, we were in the district of Sialkot in Punjab, uh, and we were working in three sub-districts, covering a total population of 400,000. Very quickly, the key definitions that we use within the study in terms of uh, identifying whether a child did or did not have the targeted criteria, um, these were quite strict criteria so that we could, we could look at the validity of the study. Um, child, obviously very straightforward UN definition. Uh, in terms of a physical impairment within the study, uh, we define that as a substantial impairment of six months duration um, or from birth if the child was younger than six months affecting the child's functions as per not being able to easily do one or more of the key domains of the Washington Group questions, which I'll come on to uh, next. For visual impairment and hearing impairment, these were bilateral. Uh, so for visual impairment, it was a preventing vision of less than 660 in the better eye. Uh, and for hearing, the hearing of uh, 30 decibels, hearing loss in both ears at least, uh, or failure of autoacoustic emission uh, testing in both ears. Now, we've also got the caveat there that also of a strong clinical suspicion by an ear, nose and throat specialist because we did have the situation at some of the screening camps where the children presented with discharging ears or had communication problems that made it difficult for us to actually screen as per our, our field testing and diagnostic tools. So in those situations, uh, we allow the ENT specialist to... Um, make a statement, a judgment statement, that they presume the child to have a severe bilateral hearing impairment and the child was then sent on for further testing. And for epilepsy, it was simply a history of two or more tonic-clonic seizures within the past three months. So the Washington Group questions, most people probably will be familiar with them, um, but for those who aren't, they were developed by the World Bank. Um, they are a set of questions that focus on an individual self-report um, of basic functional domains, uh, basic actions, sorry, or functional domains. There is an extended set. We actually used the short set, which focuses on a person's ability to see, hear, walk, climb steps, uh, talk, or conduct self-care, for example, washing or dressing. Um, the responses are on a threshold. The person is asked whether they have no problem in uh, carrying out the activity, uh, some problem, lots of problem, or whether they're unable to do their, the activity. 
And there's a severity threshold that you can use to then calculate whether or not that person is at greater risk of disability. Um, it is a, a question set that is used quite frequently, quite widely in population-based uh, surveys and in disability surveys. So we included these to compare the self-reported disability um, against the clinical um, the clinically evaluated uh, criteria that we had, the objective criteria of impairment. So moving on to the training of the key informants, um, this was led by the project field staff uh, named Community Mobilizers, who would spend between four and six weeks in each sub-district in the study, networking, recruiting key informants, providing the training and the ongoing support organising the examination days um, and facilitating and assisting with the onward referrals. As I mentioned in the flowchart, we uh, recruited one key informant per village um, based on the social networks and capital within that. If you remember, the, the key first point was mapping the community social networks and taking the key informants from within those based on that mapping exercise. So there were a range of professions, uh, council members, teachers, religious leaders, NGO workers. Uh, we trained a total of 1,510 key informants in Bangladesh uh, and 589 in Pakistan, uh, which works out roughly about I think 650 to 670 total population per KI, if you um, look at it population-wise. The training itself consisted of the development of a uh, flip chart, um, which was used to promote the concepts of uh, the different targeted impairments and also generalise discussion on child disability. There was also a lot of dialogue, a lot of um, time for discussion, and I have a couple of just paper printout copies of the flip book here. Um, if anybody's interested, please just come and ask me at the end, I can show you those. Um, they were adapted in both Bangladesh and Pakistan so that they would be uh, contextually relevant. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, they focus on specific men messages about <coughs> specific health conditions and the target impairment criteria and the generalised discussion. And there's just a picture of one of our community mobilisers um, conducting a training session. And the little insert picture on the left is some of the is from Bangladesh and on the right is from Pakistan. Um, in terms of the evolving of the methodology, obviously I mentioned that we did it conducted it phase wise. So given that it had previously been validated for one impairment at a time, as I said, either for child blindness or for epilepsy in children, um, there was a concern at the outset of the project that perhaps by trying to um, train key informants to identify multiple types of impairments at the same time, that this may mean that may have meant that children were being missed. Um, so in the pilot, the five sub-districts had different, slightly different processes in each. In the first four, key informants were trained on one impairment type only, on the identification of children with either vision, visual impairment in one sub-district, hearing impairment in the other, physical in the other, and epilepsy in the other. And then in the fifth, um, looking at whether or not training them on all the impairment types uh, simultaneously. Additionally to the children that the key informants then went out to, and listed, a um, proportion of children that hadn't been listed by the key informants from within that community was also asked if they could attend the camp so that we could look at the difference there between the children being listed and, uh, and not being listed. And just very briefly there, these were the results from that exercise, from that pilot, um, that actually by um, combining all the impairment types together, providing the training on identification of, of different types of impairment simultaneously, we weren't missing children, we weren't losing anything by that. It was also found, this isn't elucidated by those numbers, but also found that the community uptake was much higher in the combined approach. Obviously, also, we realised that there is quite a high incidence of multiple impairment. So for all these reasons combined, it was decided to, to follow on with the main study uh, with a combined camp approach. Uh, so these are just some of the, the numbers from Bangladesh from that combined approach from the main study. In total, we had 57 camps organised uh, and just shy of 4,000 children listed by the key informants. Um, of those, 95% actually attended the camps uh, and were examined for the specific impairments that were targeted. Uh, we also screened just under 5,500 5, children who hadn't been listed by the key informants uh, for comparison. And as I said, it was a multidisciplinary team made up, as you can <coughs> see, of uh, paediatricians and specialists in various domains. 
So each child invited to a clinical camp was screened by the entire team, regardless of what the um, preliminary uh, diagnosis had been by the key informant. And all children were provided with uh, referrals as needed. And it's important, I think, to note that that was all children brought to the camp with any unmet health care need uh, was provided with that referral service, not just those who screen positive as per the study. The referrals themselves, um, that, as we mentioned, was uh, preceded by a referral network mapping in East District to understand what services would be available, um, be they local services, government services, uh, NGO or subsidised private services. Um, and we attempted, wherever possible, to make links with those services in advance um, and to refer the child on to the nearest possible centre, if not, um, with support provided by the, the field staff, the community mobilisers that I mentioned. Um, and as I said, yes, referrals offered to all children presenting with unmet healthcare needs. Um, and then finally, on, alongside the key informant method that we were using, there's a way of trying to... Um, validate the methodology and to understand whether or not it was working in comparison to a population-based survey. We also conducted quite a large household survey um, in 15 clusters in the same sub-districts. So this was a cluster randomised sample using uh, probability proportion to size um, and all children within the selected clusters uh, between the ages of 0 and 18 were examined using the same uh, clinical examination form that we used within the KIM screening camps. A few assumptions there from the, um, the, in the survey design, the disability prevalence at 16 per thousand, design effect of two, 95% uh, confidence interval and an 85% response rate. So within that sample we enumerated uh, 8,470 children um, and examined 96% of those. It's just a few pictures of our diagnostic tools there, the tumbling E and the OAE machine. And one year post-intervention, we followed up with 287 of the children um, to ascertain the impact of both the referral that they'd been provided through the study and the uh, intervention itself. Um, and we'll briefly mention the results of that as well. And I think that rounds up, I hope, how we uh, designed and implemented the study. And now if I can ask Professor Murthy to come and explain what we found out as a result. Thank you, Ayla. I think this is the most appropriate room to talk about disability. All of us have exercise for our cervical spine. I have to look up, you have to look down, so it's a good place to have therapy while we listen to the presentation. Ayla just mentioned how our MI5 agents were spread across Bangladesh. The key informants were spies in the community trying to gather information on the different conditions. But unlike MI5 agents, they were not armed. They didn't have any weapons with them. And uh, also their cover was blown because everybody knew that they were agents. And luckily there was no Anna Chapman in uh, these MI5 agents. So we were on the safer side. I'll try and look at some of the results based on uh, the three major objectives which Alan had mentioned earlier. Looking first at who were these children who were picked up by the key informants, and you look at their age distribution, you find that in Bangladesh, about a third were children aged six to 10. Just under a third were children aged under five and about 15% were aged 15 to 18 years. Look at the distribution of uh, gender. 56% were male amongst those identified by the key informants, and 44% were female. I'm going to come back to the Pakistan distribution after taking you through the next slide. We actually wanted to look at this particular difference amongst children who were listed by the key informants and examined at the screening camps were the ratios <coughs> between males and females, were they similar or were they divergent from what the household survey had shown? If you look at the uh, household survey, you look at the numbers examined and look at the proportions, male and female, 
you find that the proportion was almost the same. So in terms of identifying children to be examined at the household survey, there was no gender difference. But when you look at the screen positive for any of the disabilities or the impairments which Ayla has just mentioned, you find that even in the household, there was a difference in the ratios, 55% <laughs> amongst males compared to uh, the females. So this distribution that we had at the camps seemed to be a true gender difference in Bangladesh. I would not be able to talk about the exact reasons because we did not go into that, but that seems to be the pattern. If you look at the Pakistan cohort, and I'd like to mention that in relation to the data from Pakistan, it came in very late because it was the last stage of the study, and we are still in the process of doing the complete analysis. But some of the uh, basic demographic information which we have, which I'm just presenting. If you look at the Kim identification of children by their age and gender, you find that between Pakistan and Bangladesh, there were a lot of similarities. There was hardly any difference in the proportions that were brought up by the key informants in both the countries. The other thing we looked at was, was the method equally valid in both the, both the situations? Because it was developed in Bangladesh, we also needed to try and look at how it behaved in Pakistan. And we find, when we look at the sensitivity and specificity, consistently, the sensitivity has been high, whereas specificity in both Bangladesh and Pakistan has been low. And the low specificity that we looked at <coughs> when we did a sub-analysis, what we found was that a large number of children in relation to suffering as diagnosed by the key informants, they had some problem. Overall, less than 5% of the children who came to the chem camps were those children who did not uh, have any health problem. But the majority had either mild or moderate grades of impairment, unilateral involvement, which did not fit in into the criteria that we had actually selected for the study. We also had children who had congestive heart failure, uh, rheumatic heart disease, learning disabilities, which were not targeted impairments as part of this particular study. We also had children who came with respiratory infections and other infections because the availability of services in Bangladesh was minimal and here was an opportunity to access healthcare. The further results that I'm going to present are only in relation to Bangladesh because we've not had the complete data analysis done for Pakistan as yet. <coughs> One of the first objectives was whether key informants could identify children with disabilities, the specified targeted impairments that we're talking about, and the high sensitivity <coughs> meant that they were picking up that the case detection was high. The second thing that we wanted to look at was could we use this high detection rate by the key informants to try and estimate the prevalence in those communities. And for this particular purpose, because the key informants were able to identify almost everybody amongst those who had the severe grades of impairment that we were looking at, the population of the villages from where the key informants did the case identification, we took that as the denominator, which is shown here as 258,000, and then looked at the numbers to work out the prevalence rates. Look at the second column, which looks at the figures that we have from the household survey, where 8,120 were examined, and you compare the prevalences. Let's look at physical first. You have 6.2 per thousand in the chem, with the 95% confidence intervals indicated there, and 8% in the population-based household survey, 
using the same diagnostic criteria to label them as physically impaired. In relation to bilateral vision impairment, you have 0.7 per 1,000 in the chem we service 0.5 per 1,000 children in the household survey. If you look at the next row, that was a problem area for us. We looked at confirmed bilateral hearing impairment and you find that it is as low as 0.3 per 1,000 in the key informant method, using the key informant method, but as against 6.4 per 1,000 in the household survey. Now what we realized was that a large number of children couldn't get the objective test done because they had a discharging ear. So if you look at presumed hearing impairment based on the clinical diagnosis of the uh, ENT surgeons, it is much higher. But for the comparison, we wanted to use the confirmed hearing impaired, which is looking at either the acoustic emissions, the child failing on that, or pure tone audiometry, showing that the child had hearing impairment. But that was one area of concern which we were able to flag up uh, in relation to using the Kim method. If you look at specific health conditions and their prevalence, the prevalence in relation to cerebral palsy, again, their overlapping contents intervals, 3.7 vis a vis 2.6. Look at epilepsy, 1.5 vis a vis 2.2, again, an overlap on the contents intervals. If you look at a combination of one or more of the above, the physical, bilateral vision, or hearing, then you find that it is 9 per 1,000 children in Kim, we service 14.7 per 1,000 in the household survey. If I exclude hearing impairment because of the problems that I just mentioned with hearing impairment, and then look at one or more of the above, excluding hearing impairment, you find that there is concordance between the two estimates from the Kim as well as the household survey. <coughs> We looked at the Washington Group criteria also to look at the prevalence of disability. And we dropped the question on communication here. We used five questions. And then you look at the comparison. We found a higher prevalence in the Kim compared to the household survey. If we try and ex extrapolate this to a million population, which is useful as a planning tool to plan for a million population, you're looking at about if I go right down to one or more excluding hearing impairment, you're looking at about 3,000. If we had better tools for hearing impaired, it would be much higher than the 3,700, which has been shown in the estimates here. But it is giving us information on how we could provide for wheelchairs, for cat pediatric cataract surgery, or hearing aid, aids if required from using a method like the KIM to help us in planning appropriate interventions. We looked at the Washington Group criteria in greater detail. And if you look at the key informant method and try and look at the Washington Group criteria there, amongst the entire population which was examined at the key informant camps, nearly 10% had a problem with the domain of vision. A quarter, 25%, looking at either some, act, some difficulty, a lot of difficulty, or unable to do it, about a quarter. If you look at mobility, communication, and self-care, nearly 50% of the children examined at the key informant camps, they had problems with mobility, communication, and self-care. Trying to look at the impairment versus the Washington Group criteria, if you look at vision, and you look at the column of visual impairment here, 71.7%, <laughs> that's nearly three out of every four children who had a problem on the domain of vision on Washington Group criteria were detected to have visual impairment. When you look at hearing impairment, it's even higher, the domain of complaining about hearing. And the, the complaint about hearing, we serve as the diagnosis of hearing impairment, 
to concordance was 81%. Looking at physical, about 70%. If you look down the hearing impairment column, and you look at communication from the Washington group criteria, you find that nearly three out of four children who had a hearing impairment did have a communication problem. So there is a good concordance between the Washington group criteria and clinical diagnosis in the results that we were able to put together. The gender difference between the uh, different conditions was again very consistent. It was nearly two is to three, that is 60% were males and 40% were females. And this was consistent across all the conditions, though the proportions vary a little bit. If you looked at the history of onset and look at one parameter, that is history of onset at birth, in relation to the different conditions, physical impairments, nearly two thirds, it was a history of onset at birth. In relation to vision impairment, about half at birth, hearing impairment about a third. And if you look at cerebral palsy, the last bar that you see there, three out of four children, the parents said that it was present from birth. So a significant proportion of the different impairments were present at birth. But if you look at a comparison between them, you look at hearing impairment, 36%, it means that the opportunity to have preventive measures in a condition like hearing impairment is much higher because most of it is because of otitis media, which is later on in life and can actually be acted upon. And we know that for vision, 50%, 45 to 50% in children are avoidable. We also try to look at the access to school. This could be either mainstream schooling or it could uh, pertain to special schools. There were only eight children in the entire cohort who were actually going to a special school. And we also put together the proportion of children in a normative database who were going to school so that you could compare between the children who did not have any impairment, what proportion of them accessed schooling in Bangladesh. If you look at all these conditions, the worst situation is in relation to epilepsy or cerebral palsy where the access is poorer than for the other conditions. But even for the children, the normative uh, database, 16% did not go to school. When we looked at reasons why these children did not go to school, amongst those 993 who did not go to school, the biggest chunk was the provider's issue. So something which is completely avoidable, something which can be changed with 45%, nearly half the children not being able to go to school because the school teachers or school admin did not allow them to go to school. The second biggest group was parent refusal against another, again another group which can actually be changed with changing attitudes and perceptions. <laughs> That's something which can uh, be different. Which means that out of every 10 children who were disabled, eight did not go to school because the society or the community or the family did not permit them to go to school. So this is something which we can work on to improve the participation of these children in Bangladesh. We also looked at whether these children had prior access to any services, those who were diagnosed to have an impairment. And you again find that about 40%, that is four out of every 10 children did access rehabilitative services in the past, but a large proportion, nearly half of them, were advised about something but were not provided anything specifically. 
And that's why uh, the sort of access to service is further compounded by this lack of provision of services. And you find that in relation to all these conditions, the access to services was the least with the hearing impaired. In relation to the key informant method, we need to keep in mind that a large proportion of them, as I had mentioned, also suffered from unilateral conditions or a discharging year at the time of the camp. So that is why they may not have accessed services in the past. Looking at the reasons why they did not access services, again something where action can be taken, where NGO institutions can play a big role, is that there was a lack of awareness in more than a third, 38%, and in 58% it was a financial issue. So making services affordable, increasing awareness of services, which again can, if there is more awareness, and services themselves become more affordable because of the volumes, so they could be a business model, if not uh, an organization supporting the monetary costs of these services. Issues like transport and other problems were very minimal. We also looked at <coughs> the barriers through two different mechanisms. One was a qualitative study done independently, and one was a quantitative study. And these three barriers came out to be significant. And these were the socioeconomic status of the families, maternal literacy, and the distance to a, refer to a referral unit. Like Ayla had mentioned, the study in Bangladesh was done in Siraj Ganj, which is the nearest to Dhaka, and the service availability was, the nearest service availability was in relation to many conditions only at Dhaka. And Dhaka is about 180 to 200 kilometers away from the nearest point, and that is from Siraj Ganj. And so distance to referral for specialist services in Bangladesh was a problem, even otherwise when we did the resources mapping. The follow-up impact were 237 children, 287 children were followed up, and when we looked at some of the uh, uh, responses from them, all of them felt that attending the camp benefited them, and 80% were happy in the sort of referral network or system that was set up to help them in these camps. 5% did not take up the services offered, they didn't have to pay for these services. All the services were paid for, but they had out-of-pocket expenses like transportation, etc., for repeat visits. For one visit, it was covered, but for repeat visits, it was not covered. And a third of the children did not go for the repeat follow-up visits that were required. They went once, but did not follow up as required. Uh, later on, and the problems there were <coughs> the availability of a person to transport them, resistance from the family because they did not see a difference if it is cerebral palsy, or issues related to transport, where transporting a disabled child was a problem. So based on that, if we were to look at what the implications are, from the study that was done here, we were able to do a baseline mapping of the available uh, referral programs in Bangladesh. And data which added a lot of value on the prevalence, the fact that we could try and do accrued prevalence from the key informant to help us in planning for services for these <coughs> targeted impairments in the Bangladesh situation. We were able to gather data on the onset and causality the types of referrals needed and the quantum of referrals needed. Look at problems related to access in education, to rehabilitation services, and the barriers which hindered referral uptake. If you look at how we could maximize the output using a method like KEM, foremost, you have to have a strong engagement of the local stakeholders. And these are important if you're looking at long-term sustainability, 
and it requires commitment from the regional and district level government facilities, the educational and rehabilitative service providers, community leadership, NGOs, and the disabled persons organizations. So all of them need to be involved in, and a similar effort was made in the study in Bangladesh. If you do that, then you're able to actually maximize the benefit of a method like KIMP. You also could work for advocacy at the community level. The involvement of the key informants was very crucial for the success of this sort of a method. But you need to have the key informants interested and motivated in the long term. They could help you in spreading messages, even if they're not working for you on a full-time basis or a part-time basis. The very fact that they've been, their awareness levels have been increased means they'll put that into practice. They spread messages. They let people know where they could go for referral, even if you're not there later on. They help in motivating populations for follow-up and could also be of great use in trying to target the barriers to the uptake of services. So the important take-home messages, firstly, we feel that a key informant method is an effective way of identifying children with specific impairments. The information which the key informants were able to provide can be used to plan appropriate services. And this is not just in relation to the medical services, but because of data on access to education and rehabilitative support, one can actually use this sort of data, tailor it to specific needs for education as well as for rehab support. The key informants we found could be used to spread messages in the community and follow them up because a large number of key informants came back and said that can you give us more skill, can you help us to actually try and do something for our communities because we are the local leadership. We therefore feel that the KIM is a sustainable and participatory community-based approach and that the key informants can be excellent for advocacy for children with disabilities and help, and that in turn helps, snowballs their participation levels. There were limitations, and I've mentioned the limitation in relation to hearing impairment. That was a concern, and we still need to work on methods and how we could improve detection by key informants or try and look at a two-stage screening process, as some people have done, where you add a potential screener like the acoustic <coughs> emissions test along with the key informant lists that are provided. The opportunity exists now using this model to develop a more holistic tool which would look at other childhood disabilities. We did not look at intellectual impairments in the context of Bangladesh because after a lot of debate, we found that there was a lack of services. And if you identify somebody in the community, what is it that we could do was a big question mark for us. And that's why we were not able to do that. But there are methods. There could be countries. There could be communities where such services are available. And we could try and have a more holistic tool. We have to be prepared for the fact that in countries like Bangladesh or in areas where there is poorer access to health care, you would have a large number of children with mild, moderate, unilateral conditions as well as other health conditions who may come up. And your specificity, if you're using a method like the Kim with strict definitions, as we did, may appear to be low. But here are children who need services which have not been provided to them, and that's why they're here to seek attention at the camps. The opportunity in terms of sustainability would lie in trying to have a replacement or a local adaptation for the community mobilizers so that you don't need somebody from an organization or an employee, but if you could look at 
building up capacity using the existing health system in the country to try and build that capacity which is equivalent to community mobilizers, then it may be something which one could look at in the long run. At the end of the day, there was a lot of material that we collected. And when we sat down and did an analysis, we saw that there was a great opportunity to develop a toolkit or a package on key informant methods and advocacy which could be used in different countries. So there are these opportunities, and we need to look at these opportunities. So the limitations themselves are opportunities for further improving the key informant methodology. Thank you for your kind attention. And the report, the final report, is due to be released in December 2012. And results from Pakistan, we hope, will be able to get it before we have the report out. Thank you. OK, we've got about 25 minutes um, for any questions. And I'll let GV or Isla decide who's going to answer, depending on the question. So any questions? Everyone's thinking about their drinks. Yes. Um, yes, so, uh, my name is James Thornberry, and I work for Sense International. Um, I'd be very keen to learn how this data, once it's been published, how it can be used for additional advocacy at international level, as I'm sure you're aware, and probably people are more aware than I am in this room, of the debate around the um, uh, what's going to happen post-2015 and the fact that none of the NDGs even mention disability. And evidently, there is a, there's a very strong argument for disabilities to be explicitly mentioned post in whatever post-2015 framework there's going to be. One can think of very many ways that this could be cut, but how do you see this data being used by yourselves as a lobbying tool to assist us <coughs> in getting disabilities explicitly mentioned post-2015? Um, yeah, no, I, com I completely agree uh, that it's incredibly important that we, at the moment, stand at a, a good... Um, a tipping point, as it were, you know, in the, the run-up to the post-2015 agenda. This is a very valuable time for this information to be in the public domain, and that already there, there's a lot of discussion that post-2015 should be about the most vulnerable and the most marginalised, but often that doesn't actually specifically mention disability. So it's important, you know, we have a, an obligation to make sure that this information does does get out there into the, the public. We will have the main report launching uh, at the end of the month. That's going to be quite a chunky report. We're also putting together smaller uh, summary reports and policy briefs that will have the key messages that we hope that you've been able to take away uh, from the talk today, but then are transferable and can be used and circulated. And of course, as we're funded by CBM, which has quite a key role in this sector, through CBM's fantastic network that it has that goes down to sort of regional, country, local level, that is a very key dissemination strategy for us to make sure that it doesn't just stay within a, a scientific, academic um, realm, but actually becomes quite usable information that can, can be used sort of at the, um, the local level and obviously, of course, importantly for advocacy. I mean, only <coughs> to add that we are relatively recently part of the Bond Disability Networking Group and we're also feeding into that group as well. So that's an extra opportunity within the UK. Any other questions? Yes. main concern, again, when you're looking at the under twos, would relate to hearing and communication. That would be the major chunk. And like I said, there were concerns about hearing impaired because we were not able to examine uh, them using an objective criteria. 
But at the household survey level, if I could use that as an example, in terms of testing for with the OAA, there was no problem, even for children less than two years. In terms of mother's parental perception, there was no problem. But using objective tests at the key informant camp, there was a problem with these two areas. But the others, like physical, where mobility was a problem, obviously, unless the child starts walking, the mother may not have realized it. So there would be problems like that. We've not done a segregated analysis by different age groups, but that's a, a good idea, and we'll have a look at that. In relation to education and rehabilitative support, we had very limited information collected as part of this because that was not the major focus. But one can tailor a method like the KIM to actually collect that information. And we were able to see that that sort of information would flow very well with the key informants who are local leaders, have a stake in the communities, but you need to tailor it for those needs, which was not done here. We just looked at, were these children going to school? If not, what were the reasons? And these only were uh, for children above the age of five. So it's not early schooling or preschooling was not actually targeted in this particular study. And maybe it's one small addition um, to that. One thing that was of note in that education, as uh, Professor Murphy mentioned, it's quite a small section that we have on, on education. But one thing that we found that was um, perhaps as somebody who, who has more background in education is something you'd expect. We found that a lot of the older, obviously there's a drop off as the children get older, there's less and less in school. But of those who still are in school, predominantly they were actually in school grades below uh, the school grade for their, their um, age. Um, so, that's, so that's one piece of information that we did have from it. This was parental perception. So that obviously there is a caveat there. And the, the pie chart that was there, um, you, we had a, a multi, multiple choice answer for that with the opportunity for parents to, to offer different things. So you've got to, to bear in mind that there may be uh, misunderstandings there, and it is the parent's perception. And whilst we did um, try very hard to actually get the child's perception, to have the child filling out the form as much as possible, in reality, we found very the vast majority, even for the older children, those who didn't have community um, problems, uh, community, uh, communication. communication problems. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very completely blank. Uh, but still, the parents or the caregiver would insist on filling in the, um, the form. So you've got to bear that in mind. That's quite important too. But at the same time, if you, the parents may feel uh, ashamed to mention that they didn't allow them to go to school. <coughs> but if you put those two categories together, children, uh, parents not allowing them, and schools not accepting. That's 80%. So whether they pass the buck on to each other, ultimately in terms of action, it's that 80% we need to target. Claire, I hope that's an easy question for me. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, the chart which looked at different impairments, uh, that actually shows that it is very similar across all the uh, age groups, uh, all the uh, impairments. But we don't have age stratified data to say, if you look at this particular slide, 
in relation to all the impairments, this gender difference was seen. But uh, the age stratification of this was the uh, uh, higher gender difference at 0 to 5 or 6 to 10. Uh, I don't think we've looked at that right now. But that's something which can be done. Yeah. Do you need to follow on to that? Yeah. Do you think this is due to increased mortality in girls with disability? That was uh, my first uh, worry. Increased mortality, either natural or artificial. Because uh, when you look at the household survey, the proportions available were similar. So that actually set at rest some of the concerns because when we went into the villages, the number of males and females were similar. But in terms of disability, if there is female infanticide in the first uh, six months of life, then that can reflect in this. But we've not gone into uh, those causes. It could be one of the causes that there is higher mortality, both naturally as well as an induced mortality in some of these situations. Yes, at the back. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I completely agree. That's a really important question. We didn't hold um, particular sort of focus group discussion um, type analysis post intervention, but of course we did have the follow up questionnaire um, for that cohort of 287, which looked. It didn't look specifically at whether or not there was a feeling of stigma, but that the overall um, experience felt by the families who were, we, we went to follow up was positive. Um, I think that's another, yet another reason why we found that it was, um, we had to exclude intellectual impairment, because obviously if you are labelling a child as having something that makes them different and not providing any support to allow that child to um, increase their participation, to have an equal opportunity, then actually I think... I think most of us would agree that's a, very, that's a negative intervention to be having. Um, I would also say that the children in the study with unmet health care needs were all provided with that follow-up um, support, the referral intervention, uh, medical rehabilitative, etc. So the, um, I guess, I, I suppose it is an assumption there. The assumption is that the, for the whole cohort, not just those 287 that we followed up, that it would have been a positive experience in destigmatizing rather than stigmatizing because it was increasing the child's opportunity to, to participate. And one other thing to mention, I, I put on the slide there in the, the flow chart that we had this retraining module, this, this second module that we piloted. We didn't actually go into it very much um, in the presentation. But we actually piloted a second module for the key informants that went beyond identification and equipped them with a lot more uh, key messages and understanding about disability in the community. So we actually we left that as a, an ongoing um, method for key informants to actually try to break down stigmas wherever possible, to actually try to unpick ideas and to, to carry that forward. And that was a really positive um, outcome of the, the initial training that focused on identification is talking to those key informants, those members of the community who'd been picked based on their, um, their social network, that they themselves felt that they had very much had their eyes open to disability. They all you know, spoke very strongly that they felt that they had learned a lot, that they had thought wrongly about disability, that they'd had these misconceptions, and they wanted to be a part of destigmatizing the concept amongst their community. So, so I'd say that I, I think we hope that it hasn't provided any negative stigma attached to the child by the labelling, but it's not something that we looked at specifically. I mean, I might just add, and it's taking us on to another study, but we have done a parent training <coughs> support group for children with cerebral palsy with this group because there were no services, and we're just finishing that now, bringing parents together and providing training to them. And you know, one of the key feedbacks has been the kind of relief of meeting <laughs> other parents who've got children with cerebral palsy and that, you know, sense of isolation. Even within the same village, they didn't know that those other mothers had children with cerebral palsy and, and, and that's been one of the outcomes of the parent support groups. Um, that's been a follow-on from this. So I mean, that might go some way to answering 
your question. Right, we've got two more questions, and then I might ask Alan if he wants to make any concluding remarks. So um, I can't remember your name, but from Sense International, I think. Unfortunately, no. Not the, the socio-economic data that we collected was quite was based. It was based on literacy, um, income, um, and a rural urban demographic. We didn't actually look further, but I completely agree. I think that that's something that we look at in our centre as being really important. Um, co well, not consequence, because it's not causal necessarily, but a, a relationship that is very important to to ascertain very much. And there was and there were one last one from Lisa at the top. Sure. Um, well, was, as I'm sure you already know, that the Washington Group are currently in the process of developing an extended set on functioning purely uh, for children. The set that we used, the short set, was the set developed for adults, which we had to use as a proxy at the time, given that there was no uh, set for for children. And one of the major differences, I think, that there will be once the, the set comes out for, for children, which will be an extended set at the moment, there is no discussion for a short set for children that will come further down the line, um, but is it will be directed specifically at a caregiver in relation to their child, whereas, of course, we had to adapt the short set for adults, which is about self-report. So I think that's a really important um, difference that we'll see when the Washington Group have validated or uh, piloted the new questions. I think that will make a, a difference. Um, but we did see there was a concordance that was, as you saw, with the, you know, in terms of what the clinically diagnosed impairment and the functioning domain where there was concordance there. Um, but I think that we'll have to see how the questions finalise. I think they should be launching them within the coming weeks or month. Okay, I'll hand over to Alan for some concluding comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to GV and thank you to Arla for excellent presentations, but more importantly, all the work you've done. Um, I, I think for me, I listened to it, um, and I hadn't heard this before and, and the, the written report is not out yet listening to it I, I think there was four messages for me one is that by and large the key informants work they probably don't work for hearing loss at the moment but it's probably better than nothing still even for hearing loss uh, and they are volunteers um, and so this is and, and there's lots of the added value they're coming from the community they can do advocacy afterwards and so on so that would be a very kind of I would say positive message of the key informants it works by and large the second is um, if we are looking at severe disability in children remember these definitions were severe disability then a take home number seems to be approximating 4,000 children per million population. The figure here was 3,700, but it will underestimate hearing impairment. There will be more of those. So we're probably looking at 4,000 children per million total population with severe visual hearing or physical impairment. And that's an important take home message. It is for Bangladesh, doesn't mean it's for everywhere, but it is for Bangladesh. Um, and most of those children, half, had never accessed services before. And of those that had accessed services, a lot of it was just advice. And then you had the thing of limited access to education as well. So, you know, that's telling us about that situation. That's, that's perhaps the second message. <laughs> The third message, which to be aware of, is this is specific to that situation. 
So we can't turn around and say key informants will work in Africa and there's 4,000 severely disabled children per million population in Africa. We need more information to know that because key informants may work in Bangladesh. We think they work in Pakistan, but we're not actually quite sure about that. It's a different group of people. Um, so we need to know that. The last thing, and probably this is the most important and actually the most worrying, I think, for me personally, is uh, so what for those kids? Um, uh, we, we heard the follow-up where you followed up 200 and something, but there was nearly 4,000, right? Uh, and that follow-up was one year. And, you know, whatever we do with key informants, whatever data we get, whatever that is, if it doesn't make a difference to those children's lives and to the parents, to their families, then it's the so what question. And so I think there's a lot of responsibility on CBM, and I speak for CBM, but also the other partners there to uh, not just stop and say, well, this was a nice study and we published a few papers and that's it. But we really need to know what needs to keep being done in order for those children and their families to get better quality of life, more participation for the society to be more inclusive. And that's a lot more work kind of going down into the future years. So thank you very much for attending the seminar. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to our presenters, thanks. Oh, now you get a drink. I wonder why you all stayed. That's right, there's a drink, isn't there? Yeah. Where, where is that? Out this way? Or? Yeah, probably the quickest way I think is just going back down to the, the front entrance again, I think. Uh, straight down to the front entrance and then just go through the double black doors on your right, downstairs on the left, but there should be a little sign to show you and you'll see all the drinks laid out and, uh, in, the, in the lower ground, yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, was it all? It was good. <laughs> was it still too far?